And we have one last question before we move on to uh, your points of view and your questions in the audience. And that was, where do you see the, the barriers uh, preventing us reaching the hard to reach um, and accessing the kind of benefits that we may or may not be describing? Um, and Laurie was going to take that first. Well, I can only speak in the case of Dr. Math in, in South Africa. And in our particular case, it's the shortage of those tutors, those university students on the other side that are, that are answering those kids' questions. So like I said before, we're not actually delivering content. It's um, a teenager primarily driven conversation. He logs in and says, I need help solving parabolas, or I need help with sine and cosine, and the tutor responds. So in our specific specific case, and it's very specific, it's that expertise, um, the person who wants to volunteer their time on the other side. And although I've been saying that they're um, South African university students, and 95% of them are, we have a sort of growing population. We have a handful of tutors in the middle of the United States, of all places in Ohio, uh, math teachers who log in and help kids in South Africa. We have a couple South Africans in Switzerland who want to give back to South Africa, and um, some growing professionals in the science, although um, in the science industry who also volunteer. Okay, but in our particular case, we need that expertise. Just like you said, it's people-to-people -people communication. It's not just content delivery. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I got out of order there. Um, in more ways than one, probably. The, uh, okay, I, I think it's those of us in the education business. We need to um, escape our school classrooms, our, our university lecture halls, um, our libraries, and actually get out there and, and focus what we're doing um, much more on the needs of the poorest and most marginalized. So actually, all these people contributing to, to your work is fantastic. And, and I think one of the challenges, you know, all too often, you know, mobiles are seen, and it's often said, as, as you know, a silver bullet to fight against poverty. Uh, just think about that language. Surely learning is about peace, not about war. Surely we should be talking, if you like, about you know, a warm silver hug, which is a communal activity. Uh, and, and, and I just use that as a kind of example of what I mean about changing the ways in which we think about these things. We need to be driven by the needs of learners, whoever they are. I, 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 I particularly you know, love working with my PhD students. Um, I see them, if, in a sense, as, as my masters. I'm there to, to support them, because they're the people who are going to make the huge differences in the world ahead. Um, but likewise, we need to be out there supporting the learning needs of farmers, the learning needs of, of all the communities we've spoken about. I think, secondly, I, I, I would just uh, go back to something I said a little bit earlier, and this question in some ways closely parallels the, the second question, and that is the rising tide of privatization in education. Okay, the market will take care of the needs of the majority, I've, I've said that before, but states fundamentally, fundamentally still have responsibility for all of their peoples. And so we need to work together with states to enable them to support delivery of learning through mobile technologies uh, in, 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 in the poorer, more distant communities. And actually, that's why I think the role of the regulators is so important. Um, I haven't heard many conversations about universal access or universal service funds. Uh, but one of the things we're doing in the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization is trying to work with the regulators, with the funds, to enable governments to roll out some of these technological solutions to the people who the market will not address. Um, and I still think we need you know, really good value for money devices. Um, yeah, smartphone prices, of course, are coming down. Um, but, but, but let's uh, try and devise devices that will really, really enable learning. Um, I'm doing a, a survey together with my Chinese colleagues on mobile learning generally. And if there are any learners here, I'd uh, love you to take part in it. But some of the early, it, it's across the world, and some of the early figures are um, Maybe surprising to those of you who believe passionately in mobile learning. You know, something like only 10% of students, and this is amongst university students, actually reckon they use their mobile device regularly for any kind of learning. 90% 
90% say that the screen size is too small. This is too small. Um, some of the, the tablets are too big. Um, free piece of advice, you know, it's going to be a device a little bit bigger than this that you can still carry around with you, not as, not as big as, as an iPad or whatever. Um, but, but let's get that cracked so we can dev dev design devices that are really going to enable learning um, in, in its richness uh, to, to take place. Um, yeah, so I, def I definitely agree with, with a lot of what you both have mentioned. Um, with regards to value for money devices, I think I would also argue that um, value for money as far as not just devices and, and the hardware again, but, this, but the idea of connectivity to 3G, I think, and, and just having access to the internet will be so powerful. I mean, with Millie even, we had such a hard time because we were creating apps, which is all fine and dandy, but how do you get them? Well, you have to go to an internet cafe or you have to get some sort of SIM card that can connect you to the internet, and that's a big barrier to entry. So we, you know, now the, after that, I started looking at text messaging the way Lori does because text messaging at the moment is the lowest common denominator, and it's a very limiting lowest common denominator. Um, so I think that's that's huge, and I think also as far as um, content goes, I think that there's a lot going on now. Um, as far as bringing content to the devices, right? We can't just put a mobile phone in the hands of everyone. We need to have the content that's on there to allow them to learn. And I think that'll be huge as well. Um, and lastly, with the, with the policy situation, I think, you know, with Digital Green, for example, the government of India has been hugely, hugely supportive of Digital Green and kind of, and trying to figure out how they can partner with us to use the mobile phones. I think, you know, China and India have the, the biggest mobile phone subscribers in the world today. So I think that the governments are coming around, but, um, slowly, I agree, very slowly, and in kind of a funny way, but well, let's see. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. I'd, I'd like to just add something coming from a different direction, and that's work we've been doing in the UK higher education sector in looking at the notion of digital literacy. Um, and that, if you like, is the concept of being able to create, express yourself, uh, comprehend a digital world, and clearly a subset of that increasingly is going to be, if you like, mobile digital literacy. How do we express ourselves and comprehend the digital and mobile world around us? Um, and for the university sector in the UK, one of those consequences is that the challenge to the role of teachers or of lecturers or professors um, that maybe owing to generational um, differences, we are going to have to persuade them of the virtues of actually learning from their students in the way maybe Tim was talking about. So uh, a shift from the teacher being the authoritative source of information, knowledge, theory, to one where the teacher is having to learn alongside, uh, to learn from their students. Um, and that's quite challenging, and people have talked about the, the difficulty of changing at a kind of systemic and professional level in other parts of the conference. And it reminds me uh, of another, if you like, um, barrier to the adoption of mobile learning, and that's clearly affording it. Um, we'll only manage to afford mobile learning if we can, if you like, exploit the fact that people, kids, adults, everyone own phones. Um, so there's a a disjunction, if you like, between e-learning and m-learning, where in e-learning or Cal, um, the institutions, the schools, the colleges, uh, the universities provided the equipment and basically defined the rules of the game. They said to students, this is the basis on which you can use the technology for learning. We're moving from that state of affairs to a state of affairs where we have to say, well, if we're going to use mobiles, it's going to have to be the learners, the students own mobiles. And both in the school sector and the university sector in conversations in South Africa and in the UK, that's quite challenging or intimidating for teachers. All of a sudden, the locus of control, if you like, who controls what's going on within the classroom has moved. Um, the, the agency, you know, uh, who's driving the learning process is a lot less likely to be centered at the front on the teacher and centered somewhere amongst the the learners. So I think that's that's one barrier we, no one else had mentioned, but I think it's probably uh, implicit in a lot of what was being said. I suppose I'd also like to commend Laurie's work, actually, because one of the, um, the holy grails of the mobile learning community has been to find sustainability. And as I say, that's 
I think, mostly going to be based around um, exploiting learners' own phones, but it also involves other players having an interest. And so Laurie has got this magic combination of um, uh, the teachers or the mentors contributing on a sustainable basis as well, and there being, I guess, some profit margin for the network as well. So everyone is getting something out of it. Thank <music> you.